Um, Charlie, please take it away. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Detlef Loos. Uh, please tell us about your living histories. Oh, thanks a lot. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to give the talk on living histories, and I'm very grateful for three for inviting me. Uh, in fact, her idea emerged at Leo Karanov's 71st birthday conference in Chicago, early October 2012. And in fact, I myself attended this conference, so Sri and I had met before. So here you see Leo, and you see several of my fellow postdocs. Uh, I myself was postdoc in Chicago from 1993 to 1995. These pictures have all been taken in 2012, but all these guys look the same right now. Um, so Leo had created an outstanding intellectual environment with excellent people, a very collaborative atmosphere. It was science-focused. It was very supportive. It was interdisciplinary. And he understood to link theory, experiments, and numerics. So I was very impressed by this conference, just as three. And uh, so I was so impressed that I found out when I look, was looking for pictures that I took a, a picture of Leo's slide. Here it is. Uh, and in fact, he wondered on how to do science, what questions are worth working on. And one of his conclusions was, have courage. You can work on whatever you want. Just take it seriously. He also asked, what is an interesting problem? How can one find a problem like this? And how do you do that? I will come back to this later, but I will start where everybody starts. This is at childhood. I grew up uh, in north of Hamburg here. I was born in Hamburg. Here you see me with my family. My father here on the right uh, was a construction engineer. And as a child, uh, I... I liked science and mathematics and engineering from the very beginning. I had a own a lab, chemistry lab, in the basement. And as you see, I also early on liked fluid dynamics and granular matter. I took part in chemistry Olympiads. I took part in national mathematics competition. I love this. But I also liked history and literature quite a bit, and that Latin and ancient Greek. And I learned, I think, early on to structure text logically. Uh, well, then I went on to study in Kiel, in Bonn and in Jülich. And what I remember of this time is that we solved problems. We got a problem sheet every week, and with, together with my fellow students, we would solve these problems often for many, many, many hours, but would dig into these problems, and I learned tremendously. I did, did my diploma in theoretical high-energy physics, uh, and then I moved on for a PhD uh, to University of Marburg to work with Siegfried Grossmann, whom you see here, uh, because of him, he fascinated me as a person. He's a great scientist and a great mentor. And because of the subject, so I worked on fully developed turbulence. This was also the title of my thesis. And with Siegfried Grossmann, I really learned science uh, and learned to reveal the physics at the blackboard to discuss and to, to discuss and, and to reveal physics, whatever it takes. After that, I went on as postdoc to University of Chicago and three rights. Scientists are wanderers and interpret explorers who radically acknowledge the sources of their ideas and the role of serendipity. And this clearly uh, holds for me, because in Chicago, I purely incidentally bumped into the problem of single bubble thermoinescence. This is a single bubble which is sound driven and which emits lights, which is pretty remarkable. I listened to a talk by Brad Barber. Uh, on this phenomenon, I've always loved to go to scientific talks. And on the way back from the talk, I passed by my fellow postdoc, Michael Brenner. Uh, and then we discussed this problem. We said, well, it can't be. What is it? We started to read all papers on bubbles by Andrea Prosperetti. I have also, always loved to read papers. And then at some point, we realized that we were working on this great problem and digging into it deeper and deeper and this for many years. We finally solved it. So single bubble thermoinescence is nothing else but illuminated bubble dynamics uh, on bubble shape stability, diffusive stability, chemical stability, and energy focus, focusing. And then all puzzle pieces fell together at the right place. This was a very lucky moment, and it was extremely satisfactory. What was then unexpected for me, that we had to fight for the acceptance of the solution. Um, and Andrea Prosperity and Leo Karnov they got convinced, and they believed in us, and they supported us. But well, then I went back to Marburg in Germany, 
Uh, and I was lucky again because my first PhD student, Sasha Hilgenfeld, uh, was great. And you see him here at a conference in Leavenworth together with Andrea Prosperetti. Uh, and I really like traveling to summer schools, workshop and conference and to have scientific discussions. And again, serendipity came. I really purely incidentally saw an advertisement of a position at the University of Twente in the Netherlands in physics today. It was on multiphase flow. Well, my interpretation of multiphase flow was, well, it's turbulence and it's bubbles. I had worked on fully developed turbulence. I had worked on a single bubble. So I just applied and I was lucky and I got this position. So there was also an experimental component in there. And by training, I was a theoretical physicist. So there, uh, there I was, 1998 in Twente. So here you see my building. Uh, and I was lucky again because there was a great budget distribution model uh, those days for 10 years. And that gave me the opportunity to grow as group, as physics of fluids group. And I was lucky because I had the opportunity to appoint Andrea Prosperetti as part-time professor. And he was in a sense complementary to Siegfried Grossman and Leo Karnoff because his taste of problem really included the deep appreciation of engineering. He was scholarly, just as the others. He had high quality standards. He was very broad. Uh, and he continuously challenged me in the discussions and, in fact, is still doing it today. Um, so I was also lucky with many excellent PhD students and postdocs and with the scientific staff uh, and also with the support staff and technicians whom you see here who are in a group have an extremely crucial role, which uh, way too often is underappreciated. The subjects of my group were turbulence and multiphase flow, micro and nanofluidics, in particular bubbles, drops, ink shed printing and wetting, but also granular flow and biomedical flow. Uh, what I like about this diversity of subjects is that there are always cross virtualization between these areas. For example, you can read back in the uh, physical review letter of last week, how we adopted a theory which we applied in turbulent uh, convection towards drop impact and in the same spirit could solve this problem on drop impact. What's also very crucial is our group seminar. We have it every Wednesday at 4 p.m. apart from Christmas time and August, but it's really extremely crucial for the exchange of idea. What we do in the group is that we combine experiment, theory and numerical simulation, both fundamental science and science with an application perspective. And fluid dynamics is a great subject for this. It's so relevant for climate, for the energy transition, for the environment, for health, for high tech, and for food and agro. There are various examples here. I don't have the time to go into it, but on YouTube, you can have a look and see every single subject here. I would like to come back to Leo's questions on how to find a good problem. My answer on this is be curious, watch, listen, and be open. There is no difference between fundamental and applied research. There is only a difference between good research and bad research. Work on problems you most enjoy. Strange things can happen on the way. What I enjoy most is to work on problems which are both scientifically outstanding and at the same time relevant or at least have an application perspective. And one example was single bubble fluorescence. It turned out that there are many applications of this in ultrasound diagnostics, in inkjet printing, in underwater acoustics, cavitation, snapping shrimp, in fact, also acoustic uh, marine geophysical survey, and many others. I summarize this in this article, Bubble Puzzles from Fundamentals to Applications, which, so to say, is my bubble, bubbly biography. So solving problems is like solving puzzles. You read and you read and you read, you calculate, you do experiments, you do numerical simulations, and you collect the pieces of the puzzle. First, they will not fit. And there are missing pieces, there are wrong pieces, and you get frustrated, so you do read more, you calculate more, and so on. But then comes this great creative moment, and it only comes if you have deeply dug into the problem. All of a sudden, and often at unexpected moments, you realize how all pieces fall together to a whole new and beautiful picture. And this is this very moment for which we do science. And then you have to convince your peers, expect resistance, but fight for your ideas. Well, how to find the problem to work on? Here are also some don'ts. Uh, I have heard um, as argument to work on a problem, it has not yet been done. 
This is an extremely weak argument. We only have finite amount of time, so use it efficiently. Another don't is not having a hypothesis. So you, you should have a hypothesis. And you either your hypothesis is right, you can prove it, then you're happy, or your hypothesis was wrong, and then you can be even happier because you learned something new. Good scientists are like good bird watchers. Be curious, have good equipment, optical equipment for bird watchers, but also often for scientists. Be patient, be at the right place, and be lucky. And then you'll find beautiful birds, or you find beautiful scientific phenomena, as you see here from our webpage of the Physics of Fluids group in Twente. I was lucky to have examples and role models, uh, different personalities at different times of my life, but for all it holds, they are content and science driven, they are hardworking, they are demanding, they have high quality standards, they are generous, and uh, integrity and scientific honesty plays a crucial role, and they trusted in me. I am tremendously grateful to them. I am also grateful to all colleagues, co-workers, postdocs, and PhD students. But now it's time for me to pay back to the next generation. And I hope that I sometimes succeed, at least by working very hard, by being collaborative, appreciative, uh, and learning from other disciplines, by identifying good and relevant problems, by emphasizing scientific honesty, and by giving trust into the young scientists. And indeed, we succeeded to educate many outstanding young scientists. So out of my group, we have now... 80 young scientists who are now uh, professors themselves all over the world. And here you see, you see them. My time has melted away, uh, and I am happy to take questions. Uh, thank you for a, a fantastic uh, talk at that left, and I'm applauding on behalf of the audience. Um, so uh, do you have a question uh, here? Um, you were talking about, you know, puzzle solving and working in a problem to achieve that creative moment. Um, I know that um, this can be can be difficult to to find the time to really work away at something with other um, with other with other responsibilities and working to perhaps achieve a result uh, that um, is is meant for um, meant for well, something that is not really your core interest. How do you achieve those creative moments, and how do you, you know, you you must find you, you must find the time. I mean, you must find the time, and you must also find the time in bigger blocks. You must hype yourself, uh, and uh, well, you must also meet with colleagues. So there must be interplay. But indeed, if you have all day long administrative meetings, I I I, I, I bet you this creative moment will not. Uh, come, you really must dig into this problem with body and soul. It's crucial. Yep, great. Um, we have one other question. Um, so how do you think of applications of your foundational research? Well, I mean, I'm very happy uh, if there are applications. Uh, so, um, uh, and uh, I, I tend to work on problems which have an application perspective. So for single bubble zone in essence, I did not know. Um, but well, then someone called me and uh, and said, "Well, it's uh, 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 sound driven bubbles. This is used for other sound diagnostics." And later, I bumped into the snapping shrimp, which also, so to say, is an application of single bubble zone in essence. And later, uh, I was approached because bubbles played a crucial role in piezoacoustic inkjet printing. So these applications popped up. So because the subject had an application perspective, and of course, very happy um, that that those applications are there. I mean, again, it holds. Be open, be curious, watch and listen. Thank you. Um, thank you again.